first I'm going to tell you uh, a bit more about Earthwatch and Freshwater Watch, just to give you some background. So Earthwatch is an environmental research organisation. Um, we're a charity and uh, we are one of the forefront organisations working in citizen science. And for anyone who doesn't know, citizen science is when you get the general public involved in any process of the scientific processes. So it could be collecting data, it could be working out what research needs to be done, it could be analysing data, sharing data, anything to do with that scientific process. And Freshwater Watch was one of our early projects that uh, works a lot on citizen science. And Freshwater Watch is just a tool for collecting um, data on water quality. So we focus a lot on nitrate and phosphate with the chemical testing. Um, and the reason for this is just because it's something that's accessible that we can use. There's so many chemicals that are in water, um, but nitrate and phosphate is something that we can test for using citizen science. We also uh, have other parameters that we look at, including a lot of observational data. So people collecting observations, which are really useful and we use them in our analysis as well. Um, so I'm going to go on and talk a bit about fresh water because I think this is something that we sometimes forget about and we forget about how important fresh water is and why it's so important. Um, and the first thing is, you know, Earth, we call Earth this blue planet, uh, but fresh water is such a tiny proportion of that. Um, as it says on this slide, nearly 100% of our water is actually salt water. And this makes it very difficult for us to use in the ways that we use fresh water. Uh, there is desalination, but it's very expensive and um, difficult to do. So our freshwater resource, resource is really small. And even with our freshwater resource, most of that is frozen in ice and snow, or it can be quite deep underground. Well, sometimes it's accessible, but not always. So it's a very, very small percentage of water that we can use and all of the animals and plants that are land loving on Earth can use for for drinking and for eating and for everything else that we use water for. Um, and there's a massive hidden hidden use of water. So we might only drink a couple of litres of water a day, but our use of water is much higher than that. It's in the products that we use and it's importantly um, the majority of our water comes use comes from agriculture. So it's for the food that we are growing. And our water is very precious, but it's also in trouble. You might have heard that um, the water cycle means that we never have uh, changing levels of water. Our fresh water will always remain the same amount, but because of the water cycle, um, it always comes back to us. But that can be a bit of a slower process than how fast we use our waters. So we're using our water at a much faster rate than it can be replenished through the water cycle. Um, so a lot of our water is locked up in the products that we make and the things that we use and in our land and in other places where we can't use it. It's also very polluted and we keep adding more and more chemicals to our waters. So you might have heard in the news recently that 100% of rivers in the UK have failed the latest environment agency chemical testing. And that wasn't the case a few years ago. And the reason for that is mainly because the tests have gotten better, not necessarily because our waters have gotten worse, although I'm sure there is a, a part of that there as well. And the reason that it's so important that we're polluting these waters is first and foremost, because we rely on those waters. So the more chemicals that we're adding into them, the more those chemicals are coming back to us. So every time you use chemicals in your home or in your gardens, they're gonna eventually get back into the water. And we, we don't want that. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of chemicals that go into the water. Um, we're coming up with new ones all the time. And unfortunately, the testing process for chemicals is a little bit, uh, the wrong way around. So we basically have to prove that chemicals are a problem rather than proving that they're safe. And this means that there can be some chemicals that we put into use in our homes and our gardens and in other places that can cause massive, massive environmental damage and damage to ourselves. And it can take years and years to even find this out and then even longer to get those chemicals banned. And when we do get those chemicals banned, another chemical in the same group will take its place that hasn't been, had any legislation against it. So you might have heard of chemicals like uh, BPA, which is a chemical com commonly used in plastic making. 
something that's very uh, very common in our waterways and uh, BPA is a bisphenol part of the bisphenol chemical group and this disrupts hormones and it's been shown to mimic the female hormone in our bodies which can have a huge impact on on us if we take it into our bodies and so you might see now that a lot of products say BPA free on them but all they've done is changed to different bisphenols so we're still getting those same hormone disrupting chemicals potentially but this, the research isn't there so we don't know the effects that are, that are being had um, so this is obviously bad news for us we we don't want these chemicals um, and the same is true for nitrates and phosphates, which we have a lot more knowledge about and actually are natural and they're not they're not damaging uh, apart from when they start getting into our waters in large amounts. So nitrates and phosphates are common, uh, commonly come into our waters through agriculture, but they also through sewage and sewage treatment works. And these two chemicals can cause lots of problems in our waterways. Um, one of the main problems that that they're causing is changes to our biodiversity and the animals and plants that live in waters and the way that they do this is that nitrates and phosphates are um, very useful chemicals for plants to grow but they encourage the very fast growing algae to grow in the water column and these will grow really really fast take over um, and start dying off really quickly and this means that there's a lot less oxygen in the water uh, it can block out the light and it leads to the um, declines in the water quality, which can kill a lot of different things. And we call that process eutrophication. You've probably all come across that because I know that you're all very keen um, people, but one of the impacts of, of these declines in our water quality is that we lose wildlife. Um, obviously there are impacts on us and how we use our water and how healthy the water is for us. Uh, but I'm sure you guys are all also very keen on the effects it has on the ecosystems themselves. And the problem with these ecosystems is they're all connected. All of the animals that live there and all of the plants that live there are all connected to each other and rely on each other. So removing one species can have a real big impact. Um, and this can depend on what species you remove. But if you remove one species, another species is going to suffer because of that. And eventually, when you're removing more and more, more and more species, you get these sort of catastrophic declines where things just start collapsing. Um, I feel like I'm being very cheery today, but there is some good news to come. So don't panic just yet. Um, so one of the main things with water is actually, although we feel like we might know quite a lot about it, we really don't. Uh, the science isn't there and the science is there less and less. Um, the environment has always been a topic that people are less put less importance on. It comes always behind the economy and behind social issues, um, even though the economy and social issues often rely on the environment. So uh, we don't have very much data and there's actually less and less monitoring going on in these catchments. And one of the ways that we can get data is to use the general public, to use people who care about their waters to collect the data, because it can be very expensive to get professionally collected data. And even if we had a massive resource, we simply don't have enough scientists and professional people to go out and collect the amount of data that we can get through the general public. Um, so this is why Earthwatch has decided that people can be a really good resource. And the other really good benefit to getting people involved is then you get them focused on their local issues. They know best what's going on in the environment anyway. So they might understand what the local problems and pollution issues are. Um, and they also might know ways to tackle them. So it's also about getting those tools to the people who are able to use them. So we have these two main pathways, um, the stewardship groups, and stewardship groups are small groups of volunteers who go out really regularly uh, over a period of time. So they might go out monthly over a few years, quarterly, um, and or more regularly. We have, we have groups collecting data at various different frequencies over various time frames, uh, but they collect a lot of data at one site or maybe a few sites, but they'll collect the data repeatedly over time. So we end up getting a really good picture of that site, of what's going on at that site, what the water quality looks like over time, and therefore what's an average 
measurement, what's sort of normal for that site, what's in range for that site, and what might be out of the ordinary. So when there's a pollution event, we're able to spot it a bit more easily. Um, and we can also spot when there's other things going on. So it gives a good overview. Um, it's a slightly more in-depth method than the water blitz. We also look at turbidity, uh, which is a measure of what's of the cloudiness of the water, of suspended materials that might be in there. Uh, the water blitz is a slightly quicker method, so it's a bit more open um, and it's, it's set for a short period of time and we collect lots of measurements. So we'll have um, hundreds or preferably more people going out over a short period of time and collecting a lot of data across a big area. So this gives us a slightly different picture. Um, if the stewardship groups are the individual pixels, the water blitz is sort of the big picture. So it shows us a big overview of that area. And it's not necessarily um, completely accurate. It's that it's a snapshot in time, which is why we do it over a really short time period so that we can compare them all to each other and kind of see what's happening on that mass scale. Um, so our latest water blitz, we collected nearly a thousand samples across the across the Thames catchment. And uh, as you hopefully can see from that map, although it's a little bit small, um, the news wasn't wasn't ex very exciting. Uh, we we can see we've got quite high levels of nitrate pollution throughout that site. Um, so it gives us a kind of overview and it means that we can also focus in on areas so we can see, okay, we've got some some blue circles on there. Is, is that is that true all the time? Is that a really special area where the water's really clear and things are going well? Um, or maybe not, maybe that was a one-off and usually the measurements are a bit different to that. And we can also zoom in maybe where there are some higher levels of pollution and try and see what's happening. So it provides an overview. And the next thing is what, what do we do with all this data? Um, and I think the most important thing for this is that it's available. Uh, you can go on our website and you can look at the data. You can email us and get the full data set. Um, it's really available for anyone to use. And the people who use it the most are the people who are collecting it. So we've got uh, these smaller projects um, or stewardship groups that are often using their data to try and solve a local issue or to look at a local problem. So they might be trying to fill a role that the government isn't able to. For example, we've got a project in Sweden that looks at very small and uh, what we call transient waters. Uh, which are often completely missed from monitoring because there's just too many of them. So we can get volunteers to go and collect data uh, on, on those water bodies that don't usually get look, looked at and find out something new. Um, in the UK, we have our very fantastic uh, Wild Oxfordshire group um, in the Oxfordshire catchment, and uh, they're really looking at the sewage treatment works and what's happening up and downstream of the sewage treatment works. And this is where you get uh, on the ground action because our Wild Oxfordshire group have gone to the water companies and to the environment agency and said, okay, the water quality below sewage treatment works is definitely not looking good and we need to do something about this. And that's when you get um, actual change happening, which is really fantastic. Another thing that's really important to us at Earthwatch is publishing scientific reports. Um, and this isn't just for the sake of science, this is as well to get citizen science on the map and make sure that citizen science is seen as something that's a useful tool and that's something um, that can contribute a lot to science. Uh, science can often seem as this really inaccessible thing for people, um, but really it's a way of just getting information and uh, being curious and asking questions. And so it goes both ways with this. Our publishing scientific reports means that we can be seen as something that's really valid on the scientific stage, and that would be feed into um, how good our data is seen by governments and by other organizations, but it's also about making the science more accessible to people. So it's not this foreign thing that seems like uh, you can't connect with it, but we, so we also, when we write a new paper, we do a a breakdown for the public, which isn't in scientific gobbledygook, but can be made sense of by most people. So it goes both ways on, on that with the data. 
Uh, the other thing that's really important to us is influencing policy and governments. And I've already talked a little bit about some of the work that Wild Oxfordshire have been doing. Um, and that's very much involved with changing the policies around water quality and getting some real change. But we're working globally. So you can see from our map there, we've got projects all over the world. And uh, some of our other projects, like we've got this project in Zambia, that's looking about how we can use freshwater watch data to provide evidence for the sustainable development goal number six, uh, which is around water quality. So we're working with the government there to, to make sure that that data can be used to provide evidence for that sustainable development goal. So that's another really useful um, thing we're doing with the data. With the Thames Water Blitz, the data, um, it kind of depends a little bit on what the project and what and what we're trying to get from the project and what the project's interested in, into how we actually use the data and what we do with the data afterwards. One of the really valuable things for the Thames Water Blitz and for all the water blitzes we run is engagement. Um, getting people out and looking at their own environment and then collecting some information about their environment and then we can help explain what that information means back. So for me one of the most powerful things we do with the Thames Water Blitz is our report that goes back into the public. Um, and this is a really kind of high level basic overview of the data. We get it out as soon as we can after the Water Blitz. Um, and we try and make it as accessible as possible. That's sometimes difficult because we're a team of scientists and sometimes it can be difficult to make sure that it's on a level that everyone can, can grasp and that it hasn't got some crazy graphs that are difficult to read. Um, but for us, it's really important to share back what people are finding out and try and explain a little bit more about what it means. Um, so I will talk a bit more about the data from the Thames Water Blitz in a minute. But another really important thing, especially for this Thames Water Blitz, is that we're trying to work out how we can feed our data into the Environment Agency. So we are currently part of a project called Sentinel, which is an Environment Agency project. And one of the things we've done with this Thames Water Blitz is we've combined the data with some river fly monitoring, um, some MORPH, which you guys might have come across, which is looking at uh, river hydrology, and um, a few other bits and pieces. So we've tried to collect a lot of citizen science data. And then we're trying to show the Environment Agency that it can work really well with their own data um, and that it's usable and it can also work well with other citizen science data to help them make correct decisions for their catchments. Uh, so I will go to our next page now. If you go to our website, and you go on our data and the water blitz results you'll be able to read a bit uh, you'll be able to read our report which has a little bit more about the data and it also gives a bit more background on why we collect data why it's important um, a bit more about these kind of things but it also has our interactive map that uh, that UKCEH has developed with us um, and that has got the the Thames water blitz data and it also has some other data there, the river fly data, the morph data, environment agency data. So it's about bringing all those different data together and building a better picture because we, we do the water quality and then the river fly looks at the invertebrate biodiversity and morph looks at what's going on with the shape of the river. So there's lots of things to be brought in together um, and they give you a better idea of what's going on. So for the Thames Water Blitz data, uh, these are some of the key things that we actually found out. Um, so unsurprisingly, unfortunately, uh, probably to all of you and definitely to us, there were medium and high concentrations of nitrates and phosphates throughout the Thames Valley catchment. Um, high nitrates were most common in flowing waters which was quite interesting and rivers going through agricultural areas were the highest which is probably to be expected. Uh, another thing that I think is really key to highlight is that nitrates and phosphates were lowest in ponds and ponds are something that are often overlooked especially in our management plans and when we're looking at these wider scales but they're such such important habitats and they provide a really important water source for land animals as well as for habitat for our water animals. So 
their um, little oases and uh, they definitely need to have a little bit more respect and, and care for and I think this has been really good that we've managed to highlight this in our data that they are such special places. We also found through the river fly data um, that the diversity of invertebrates was highest where phosphates were low. So this means the amount of different kinds of invertebrate species that were found. And that's really important because uh, there's kind of this difference between biomass and, uh, and different types. And biomass is also important, like having lots of something is, is, is good because that provides a full food source for something. But when we start to lose that diversity, those different species and those niches start disappearing, we start to lose other things within that environment, uh, which might be uh, you might lose a cleanup species and, and start getting overgrowth of algae. Or you might lose a really important food source for something else that then might disappear. So having the diversity there is, is a really important thing. And it's really interesting to see that phosphates are a massive driver there. That's something that we've seen with our stewardship groups and the Wild Oxfordshire has found in their group looking below sewage treatment works where there were really high phosphates they were getting really low numbers of, of invertebrates and, and much lower diversity. So um, that's something that we've found. And phosphates are often a more concentrated effect. So nitrates are kind of present throughout the system. But where we get high phosphates, we're getting um, lower numbers of invertebrates. So that's something that we really need to look at with regards to the sewage treatment works and, and the sewage that we've got going in. And what this means for Oxfordshire, I guess, is for Oxfordshire, the population is really growing. We've got a lot of people coming into the area and for good reason. It's a very beautiful place. Um, but that means a lot more pressure on the resources. We've got a lot more people relying on the sewage treatment works. Um, and there's a lot of pressures on the local land use and agriculture as well. Um, so potentially that could mean worsening of these systems but hopefully I'm going to give you some hope now um, about about time no more no more doom and gloom a little bit more doom and gloom but hopefully some hope now uh, so one of the things we did with the Thames Water Blitz which was also very interesting was we sent out some questionnaires to ask people who took part to see what they thought uh, kind of try and understand where they were coming from and, and what their interest was and why they were taking part. And this is one of the questions we used is who's, who is responsible for water quality and who should, who should be held, held to account sort of thing. Um, so the top three results were the environment agency, water companies and farmers. This probably isn't very surprising the environment agency that is their task to to care for the water quality and water companies and farmers are two of the biggest polluters for water quality but really uh, every, every one of these groups is um, responsible in some way for diminishing water qualities um, even the charities and environment agency who are trying to protect our waters they are all made up of people who are adding to the problem. We can't help it. We are all responsible for declines in our water quality. Um, and for me, that means we're all responsible. Finger pointing, I think, doesn't get you very far. Um, it can in some instances if done in the right way. But if we turn around and point to farmers and say, this is all your fault, then who's gonna grow our food and where are we getting our food from? And similarly, if we point to our water companies, where do we get our water from and how do we get rid of our sewage? So this is all of our responsibilities. And instead of finger pointing, I think it's better to think about what we can do as individuals and how we can influence those large organisations that might have a bigger impact than us. So we have a few more ideas in the report about things that you can do. Um, and I think the first thing that's quite easy is to just look at your own lives and your own homes and start to treat water as the precious resource that it is. Um, so that's preserving it, you know, water butts are great and thinking about the water that you use on a daily basis and how you can 
reduce that. But for me, the chemicals is a really important thing because our sewage treatment works aren't able to cope with the amount of chemicals that we're putting back into them. So if you're buying things for your homes and your gardens, um, and they can actually be the most toxic. So for farms and agriculture, there can be quite a lot more uh, regulation on the chemicals that they use. But often for home use, there can be all sorts of products that we can use that can be really toxic to aquatic life. And you might have seen that on the back, harmful to aquatic life. And if it's saying harmful to aquatic life, you, you can bet that you don't want to be having anything to do with that either. Um, so one thing is to is to just make sure that you're using the right chemicals in your home, that when you're doing your cleaning, you're trying to use natural. Um, there's lots of eco-friendly alternatives on the market or you can use vinegar and lemon, all kinds of things. So um, I think, yeah, firstly, go to your shelves and make sure you're not using stuff and in the garden, especially because that's going straight out into the environment and can be a massive problem. Uh, but for your home, there's there's very little that can be done for all of the different chemicals in terms of sewage treatment works they can get rid of some of the chemicals but there's so many things that get missed so make sure that you're keeping an eye on that um i don't know if i mentioned at the beginning but uh the growing of our food is the biggest use of water so it makes sense that we try and focus on supporting the right kind of farms so look at where you're getting your food from um try and think about local and try and think about sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture. And a massive part of this is also that you are the people, you are driving the products that you used and you're driving what happens. So don't be afraid to get involved with lobbying uh, agricultural organisations. Don't be afraid to um, talk to your MP, send them your thoughts. You might get nothing back but if more and more of us are doing this and they see it as a big issue, there's going to be people who are starting to care more about this. Um, and so make make some noise, support litter and pollution campaigns and and report any pollution that you see to the Environment Agency. Make sure that it's getting out there. And of course, I can't let this go without saying volunteering is great. If you have the time and the energy, um, Obviously, Freshwater Watch is, is one way, but there's so many organisations that have volunteering opportunities that are helpful to water quality. It's not just us. Um, and if, if we don't suit you, I'm very happy to point you to other people. We're all about being collaborative and making sure that the right things are happening. So if you have time and energy, there's a lot of volunteering opportunities. Make sure that you're getting out there, understanding your environment, collecting this data, um, and getting involved. So hopefully that wasn't too sad and miserable. Um, I don't know how long I've been, but I'm going to go on to questions now. So hopefully I haven't taken too long and we've got plenty of time. <laughs> how are we doing? Yeah, thanks very much, Kes. That's fantastic. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off First with um, Anne Cotton's um, question, if you would like to ask this, Anne, about the colour of the water on the, on the uh, water bits. Um, hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah hi. Um, I've done the Thames water blitz for the last few years, and one of the questions that you always ask is, what colour is the water? And there are various options like yellow, brown, green, etc. And I've never had any explanation as to what those different colours actually mean. So I was just wondering if you could provide a bit more, please. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so the different colours mean different things, basically. Uh, brown is usually an indication that there's lots of suspended solids, um, usually soil in the water. So that can be an indication that there's been some soil erosion in the area. Green is uh, algae. So we actually use that as part of our feedback and reporting as part of like presence. Uh, we also have the presence absence of algae, but if there's green water, that's a, um, a sign of, of small algae. Uh, yellow can be um, biological activity. Uh, I can't even remember all the water colors. I think that we have uh, clear which is is usually a sign that the water quality is quite good 
um, and then I'm not sure if there's any others, but if you, I can share our, we did a water blitz education leaflet, uh, which went out to participants, which had the breakdown of the different colors. Uh, so I can, I can resend that to you if you're interested, but hopefully that if, if there was any color that you can think of that, uh, I think there might be some pollution ones in there as well. If you can think of that I've missed, then, then shout out. Okay, no, that was great, thank you. No props. Okay, so if I can move on to Adele's, because this is a, a bit more of a specific uh, pollution question. Did you want to ask this yourself, Adele? Hi, Anne. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Kes, this is a sort of a, it's a bit of a topical question. I, I don't know if other people have picked up on this, but um, there was a study published um, in the last few days around vet veterinary medicines. Um, so um, it, the, the assertion is that, um, you know, that flea treatments um, uh, that, yeah. that aren't currently approved for use in agricultural settings, but still are a veterinary medicine, often with no prescription, that um, contamination across sort of the UK, well, I don't know if it was English waters, UK waters, but it's pretty, um, it, it, it was pretty striking. And I wondered if Earthwatch has got a sort of a view on that about, you know, how significant a problem it is. And and, you know, whether it's the sort of thing that you're able to measure may not be appropriate for citizen science projects, but I just wonder what your view is on that. Yeah, um, that was a really good question. The thing with chemicals is there are so many. I think I mentioned um, earlier, but there are hundreds of thousands of different chemicals that are in use. And basically you can produce and use in a product a new chemical with very little testing. So there's often like this flurry of excitement around uh, a new chemical that's a problem. So um, there's been like uh, DDT or uh, tributyl tin. These there's so uh, in the media in the in the seventies, I think there was the tributyl tin, which was which was a paint coat for boats, and they found that it was horrendously horrendously detrimental to to wildlife, um, and they banned it. Uh, and it's still having a massive impact today. And we've kind of forgot about it and the conversations moved on, but it's still impacting. So yeah, I'm sure flea treatment is uh, definitely, yeah, I saw that it's, it's been a problem for ponds where dogs have gone in and, and have has been a massive issue. And I'm sure it's, I would imagine it's probably quite a big issue, but there's so many different chemicals. And the other problem is when they get together in the water <laughs> and they interact with each other. Chemicals aren't just in a, and they stay on their own. Once you put them together, they start to change and they can change into new things and they can have other impacts and that can be magnified or reduced or we don't know. There's so many chemicals going into water and no, we can't measure them. Uh, not even the Environment Agency tests can measure all the chemicals because there's so many different ones. And that's part of the reason why the onus has to come back on us a bit so that we're being responsible consumers and thinking about the chemicals that we're using and what we're putting back into our environments because there's so many that are damaging. And if you want to read more about that, um, I really highly recommend the ChemTrust website. Uh, they've done so much work on, on this. So they're a really good resource for, for information. Thanks very much. It's really nice. Awesome. And that and that does move us very um, nicely into Kate Jury's uh, question, which is also about chemicals. So I, I suspect you've partially answered this, but but Kate, do you want to add anything more to that? You are yeah. I, I think I've just unmuted myself. Have I? Yes, you have. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, well, not really. I, I it's just I was very interested in the idea that one could maybe set up a group of people to a, a small group of people who are interested. We have quite a local, uh, quite an um, active local residents association. They're very interested in these issues. You know, how we might go about doing that because this spring flows down the hill from the, so it's the Southfield um, golf course at the top of um, Divinity Road in Oxford. And the spring flows down through, through many gardens. And um, during the lockdown, it was, you know, it was, possible to walk around the golf course which you can't normally and it was just it was quite a bizarre experience I found because there was just this completely manicured green which had not a single weed on it so they're mm. obviously treating it with all sorts of I mean you know I don't know what but almost everything you can think of 
and it made me think about the quality of the water that was coming down so I would just be quite interested to know how I could go about maybe getting a group of people together to 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 begin to look at that maybe one of these stewardship you know I don't know if you can count a spring that flows intermittently down through gardens as something you could have a stewardship group for but I think that would be perhaps an interesting project to think about actually. Yeah, well, I, I think there's a few things there. Um, one of the first things is the reason that we monitor nitrate and phosphate as our, as our chemistry tests, as that, as that chemical tests, is partly because it, we can, um, the, the, the kind of technology is there that means that it's really accessible for citizens to be able to do. So we use those color metric tests um, hopefully most of you might have used them, but uh, you just add water um, and you get this nice colour change and it's quite visual and uh, it's not a really expensive hundred or thousand pound probe. Um, mm -hmm. And it gives you that measure of nitrate or phosphate. Um, but the thing, uh, so, and the other reason that we focus on nitrate and phosphate is because nitrates are usually a really good indicator of agricultural pollution and phosphates can be a really good indicator of um, wastewater and that's not to say that there isn't other things in there and also that there isn't phosphates in fertilizers and nitrates in sewage there is um, but just generally speaking it's it's a beginning indication and that's kind of for me one of the, the benefits to citizen science is you get that first level and then you go back in and you look with uh, with the kits but for some of those chemicals you need a serious lab and you just can't get citizens to do that unfortunately in terms of like looking at smaller int intermittent streams absolutely if you can get a if you can get a team together we've just worked really hard to bring our costs down again um so hopefully they're more more accessible for community groups and yeah um, we have we like to look at smaller water bodies that aren't getting looked at otherwise but we can only monitor nitrate and phosphate and not some of those other chemicals because it's just not there. We don't have the technology to do it easily, so we can't. That's good. I mean, I don't. I, I have no idea what chemicals they're using up at the golf course, and I, it's not like I've got a mission against the golf course. I was just rather, actually, I have to say, horrified when I went up there yeah. and was able to walk around these acres of ground, and it was just, it was not a weed in sight. And I just thought, oh my god, what are they doing? You know? And then well, that's all yeah, that's another reason why community action can be so good. Um, like it can be a massive bite. I've had that in my local village, uh, yeah. trying to get them to stop using chemicals in the churchyard because churchyards are amazing for uh, for plant species. They're mm. sort of these like pockets where there wasn't management for a really long time. And now people are only like recently just started using so much weed killer in, in uh, churchyards and mm. strimming everything. And it's completely destroying the communities of plants there and the animals that rely on them. Yeah. So I've been working with my local churchyard back at home trying to get them to stop. And it's been such a battle just to get the wardens, try and convince the wardens that weed killers are a problem. They just are so convinced that there's there's nothing wrong with them. Mm. And of course, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's very hard to prove because environmental effects take decades and decades to prove and you need so much data and it's just not there so so, so i don't want to dominate this but just so just if i managed to get a group of say maybe nine or ten people who've got gardens that the spring flows through together could i come to you or someone and say can we set up a little project just to monitor the water quality or yeah you could yeah absolutely send me um an email i can give out my email and uh and and yeah or, or you can go on our website um and the water at earthwatch.org.uk email that's all over our website that comes direct to me as well i can send you the information about setting up a group and then if there's something you want to do you can and if not i can give you some advice on other ways that you could, hmm. could look at your local community and, and do something so yeah no, it'd be really interesting thank you thank you very much no no okay so if we can move this on quickly i think um We've got two sort of strands coming through. One is the um, sewage pollution um, that we've got various um, things talking about misconnected properties polluting local waterways with sewage. Yeah, and th that was Ruth saying they're getting no lock from Thames water. I think that is a general feeling that people are coming up with. 
Um, Anne Miller is saying that the landowners and farmers actually contribute, uh, they reckon about 30 to 20 percent of the phosphate and most of this is coming from sewage water treatment works. Um, and then we've got um, questions about how can you get local farmers, uh, you know, what should we encourage them to do near watercourses plus have we got any data back, back from the uh, catchment sensitive farming. In fact they're running a series of um, uh, lunchtime uh, video um, um, presentations at the moment to give the the uh, latest results mm -hmm. and it, it does look as if this um, low intensity farming um, no-till um, putting in um, storage water bodies to in intercept the runoff from um, manure heaps and silage clamps and things like that so it can settle out before it gets to the watercourse. I think they are, sh they are showing that this is having um, a, a very beneficial effect. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm slightly, I've got, we got, uh, I'm not going fast enough through it. <laughs> um, and I'm just worried about the timing, Roselle, for how we're doing for the, for the next stage, but... Um, uh, 